Tonight we are honored uh, in the Tri-State Catalyst Club to have as our speaker the 1991 Burwell Lecture for the National Catalysis Society. Professor Carmel Clear uh, received his bachelor's degree in 1954 from Charles University and his PhD in 1961 from the Czechoslovakian Academy of Sciences. He is currently a professor of chemistry at Lehigh University in the area of physical chemistry, surface chemistry, and catalysis. And uh, among his awards, including the uh, Burwell Lectureship or uh, the Langmuir Award in the past, his areas of research include uh, chemisorption, catalysis, molecular dynamics, chemistry and physics of solids, and uh, we are very pleased that he will be talking tonight about quote, from carbon and methane to alcohols and esters. Professor Clear. Good evening. I appreciate being here among friends. Uh, many people I know from the past and many uh, who I uh, got acquainted with uh, recently. Uh, I appreciate particularly those who drive three hours to come here and, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then have to go later three hours back home. So I get a taste of it because I, ro uh, I drove eight hours from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. To <laughs> I split it into two, two legs. Uh, if you're interested or need this, this is I'd rather prefer not, uh, if uh, everybody hears me. You're doing fine me. back here. Bye. Okay. You recognize that my title covers a vast field, <laughs> and I hope I won't be so long that those three-hour uh, drivers won't make it uh, home. But uh, basically, I start with methane. There's a lot of interest in methane conversion, and I am concentrating on the two modes of activation of methane. One is CH bond cleavage by oxidative attack. And uh, you had the last year's verbal lecture, I believe it was Jack Lansford, is that correct? But before Jack Lansford, uh, for some locals here, such as Madonna, who uh, with Keller published papers on uh, oxidative coupling of methane. And having all these luminaries uh, before me, I decided not to do C2 oxidative coupling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another type of uh, methane activation is dissociative chemisorption on metals. That you have some aggressive metals, such as titanium, when you just crack uh, the carbon-hydrogen bond at sub-freezing temperatures and uh, then you don't know what to do with the product. Uh, so obviously what we want in catalysis is an activation but also a method how to work on the fragments so that we get some useful product thereafter. <coughs> and that uh, could be oxidation of CHX fragment and in fact single crystal work uh, has shown that you can under certain conditions keep CH3 fragments or CH2 fragments, a CH fragment, an atomic carbon or agglomerated amorphous carbon or graphitic carbon. I view the contribution of the single crystal surface science to be in uh, providing us with a detail even though in practical catalysts we don't uh, uh, use uh, all that uh, detailed information, we pick uh, only that which uh, is convenient. The products uh, that are made are C2 hydrocarbons, ethane, ethane and ethylene <coughs> and of course you can burn methane to carbon dioxide. If you burn methane to carbon monoxide it's not all that bad <coughs> if the co-product of that reaction is hydrogen. And uh, you can burn methane under certain conditions partially to formaldehyde and uh, what was uh, denoted to be one of the greatest challenges, uh, by at least by catalytic associates, was to selectively oxidize methane to methanol. And the products uh, obtained from hydrogen oxidation of methane are water or hydrogen itself. Uh, so, uh, 
What I'm going to cover today is we start with this. Many of these experiments that I'm going to describe are laboratory, small scales, not ideal selectivity experiments. And then in the middle, I will show something that are monumental major industrial processes. Once we have these starting materials, we can make a step, for, a step forward. And in the end, I will show something that I consider an interesting new chemistry that's been discovered by a postdoc in our, our laboratory. Let me uh, give now the non-oxidative coupling to C2 hydrocarbons approach uh, here. Uh, the idea that we had was actually instigated by a finding by Tsai and Anderson that you can take a ZSM5 which is tickled by iron and copper and you can oxidize meta, uh, methane to methanol in small yields, near zero conversions and uh, uh, actually the space-time yields as calculated from the, uh, that short report were quite high but the yields as defined by IUPAC as a product, a product of selectivity with conversion was, were low. And uh, actually, if you take a look at these uh, methanotropic bugs, the bacteria, they have iron and copper in them also. Now, this chemistry is not a chemistry that occurs at room temperature. This is a chemistry that occurs at high temperatures. But the idea was uh, the following. Take a a framework uh, in the ZSM5 exchanged uh, or synthesized iron-3 instead of aluminum-3, you can put it in there and this is the framework oxygen put the copper in the iron exchange side and you have a kind of a coulombic pair which is separated by an oxygen bridge now what you have here is a redox uh, ion here which is going to re react with oxygen and you have a Lewis acid here. So the key to our thinking about uh, activation and conversion of methane, where well, we did not want to get these f methyl free radicals into the gaseous phase, was to have an oxidative attack, but then uh, to have the Lewis acid work on the CH3 radical so that it is converted to something like CH3 carbonium cation. And once that is uh, made, the free radical does not escape into the gaseous phase. Now the problem with the ZSM5 is there are pores in it and you make, uh, you make uh, methoxide and you make formaldehyde and you make methanol at high pressures but as it proceeds through the pores it gets oxidized further to higher oxidation products. <coughs> Zeolites have as we know very high surf internal surface areas. We also know that in oxidative coupling the requirement is that the surface areas ought to be very low. So what we did, instead of using zeolites, which did to some extent work and did produce formaldehyde, we uh, used our own old acquaintance, zinc oxide, which has zinc, oxygen, zinc, oxygen, zinc. This is a stable plane of zinc oxide. And we People who do uh, oxidative coupling know that zinc oxide is a moderate to poor oxidative C2 coupling catalyst. What we did, we implemented the idea of a redox pair on copper and Lewis acid here so that we would put a copper instead of one zinc, iron in instead of the other zinc, have them bridged by the oxygen of the zinc oxide, and that way we would create these Coulombic pairs that also exist in the zeolites. There is actually a proof, experimental proof, that we created. And these are low concentrations, 1% of copper and 1% of iron and zinc oxide. And the proof comes from high resolution ESCA. I won't go into the detail, although I can share it with you. You can, in fact, determine that the copper is in a low coordinated state, that it is univalent, that it's unambiguous, but also from EPR, so that you look at the paramagnetic electron of the iron and you look at the super hyperfine interaction with the copper nucleus, copper 63. And you get from that uh, interaction, you get evidence that these two guys are in a close proximity. We call them Coulombic pairs because copper 1 replaces zinc 2+, plus, therefore carries a formal negative charge. Iron 3 
uh, replaces zinc 2 plus and therefore ca carries a formal positive charge. So these two guys are attracted by a negative and a positive charge. Uh, now, the idea, like before, was that the copper, we actually know that, that copper picks up oxygen. Whether it splits it or not, we don't know at this moment, but let's suppose it picks up oxygen as monoxygen. It activates methane by oxidatively by abstracting hydrogen. Here is the CH3 group, and uh, that uh, is picking up the charge from the Lewis acid to become a methyl carbonium ion rather than being a free radical that goes in the phase, gaseous phase. That was a working hypothesis, but stepwise we have evidence that uh, we have actually prepared the catalyst the way we want it. It's not an easy matter uh, to do it, uh, but that is what. The next thing is the mechanism, and as we know, the mechanisms uh, are hard to prove, and one has to do a lot of spectroscopy, but this is how we think it works. Uh, we have the uh, basic chemistry for making methoxide, and then in all the systems in which by oxides, uh, catalyzed reactions, formaldehyde is formed, we think, and I think most people think, that the precursor to formaldehyde is actually methoxide, and that formaldehyde is made by hydride abstraction. So you have to have a hydride uh, acceptor, but uh, union carbide had made methanol catalyst, so homogeneous methanol catalyst was doing, which had copper one, and they say it's a copper hydride, copper one hydride exists, and there's no question about that. And this is just about to appear, of course, uh, uh, the chemcoms are only accepting the results, uh, not the uh, mechanistic arguments, this is just about to appear in chemcoms. What is actually appearing there is the selectivity switch. We initially have the zinc oxide which uh, produces the C2 hydrocarbons. By the time we have doped the zinc oxide with the uh, copper and iron, uh, we are making formaldehyde at temperatures that are lower <coughs> than those for C2 hydrocarbons and that formaldehyde chemistry simply takes over, and this is all at fairly low pressures. Uh, uh, it is believed that as you go in this uh, business of ox oxidation to oxygen, it's to higher pressures, then the selectivity to formaldehyde converts to selectivity to methanol, but we believe that you need uh, to tickle the system with a little bit of water to hydrolyze the, met the surface methoxide. So this is an oxidation catalysis to oxygenates. The yields are, the space-time yields are quite significant, but the selectivity is n are nowhere near anything commercial. Everybody knows that you don't make formaldehyde this way. But step by step by step, there are improvements, and this is one of the laboratory experiments, with the defect zinc oxide, in which we have a definite amount of two transition ions, uh, both of which make redox couples, the redox potential of Fe2, Fe3, and copper 1, copper 2 are close to each other so that they can exchange charges and, and, uh, and uh, convert from copper 1, iron 3 pair to copper 2, iron 2 pair. Now, uh, the next principle uh, of attack of methane is even simpler. It's the dissociative chemisorption of uh, methane on metals. But if you want to oxidize the fragments, uh, you need to use a metal which is not uh, non-noble. Because if you use a non-noble metal, by the time you bring in oxygen into the system, it is going to be converted to an oxide and you don't have a metal catalysis. Take titanium and you bring a little bit of oxygen, you convert titanium to titanium dioxide. So the key is to use a metal that cracks the carbon-hydrogen bond and yet dissociatively uh, uh, activates oxygen, but it's also able to release oxygen. This is an uh, example of a single crystal work on a palladium. The name of this phase is 679. The reason why we introduced this phase uh, is that we wanted to have some imperfections on it. Uh, I won't uh, get into great detail of this, but we have compared smooth surfaces and step surfaces and kink surfaces and so on. There's a tremendous structural sensitivity 
of methane oxidation on these uh, surfaces. And uh, what happens uh, with methane on this particular plane is that at low pressures, and these usual single crystal study pressure, 10 to minus 6 stores and lower, nothing happens to methane ever. Nothing. Even uh, on, on a, on a catalyst uh, that look much more perturbed than these. But by the time one increases the methane pressure to 3 or to down to 1 atmosphere, one actually cracks the carbon-hydrogen bond on palladium of this type at room temperature. Everything that is cracked remains in, on the palladium. Nothing goes at that room temperature into the gaseous phase. Then one brings in oxygen onto the palladium at room temperature after vacuum. One evacuates and still nothing happens. Then one starts cooking the crystal to higher temperatures and at relatively moderate conditions uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide comes off uh, at, uh, there is another state of carbon monoxide which comes off at higher temperatures and there's a very broad peak of the product that really uh, wouldn't be expected under oxidation conditions on palladium and that is hydrogen and I will show you on a slide that there is absolutely no water in this oxidation catalysis under these conditions as a product. This palladium crystal <coughs> makes by oxidation of methane stepwise produced makes carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and hydrogen and no water whatsoever. This is a very interesting result. Now you might say that this is a single crystal work and why should hydrogen be produced? Why should it not be oxidized to water? We have evidence from eels and other methodology that the hydrogen first sticks out upon the decomposition of methane on the surface as a hydride, but then it goes subsurface, a couple of layers, it waits there, isn't oxidized and wait there until it can recombine after the carbons on the surface have actually been oxidized. Now if you do this in a flow reactor on supported palladium, most of the time you will find a product which is carbon dioxide and water, but if you have the conditions right, your products are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen and if the selectivity to hydrogen is 85%, this is a selectivity between hydrogen and water, that means 15% water is formed. But if the selectivity is 100% to hydrogen, that means like on the single crystals, uh, no water is formed. So we are oxidizing methane to carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. In other words, we're making a synthesis gas by direct oxidation not by steam reforming. And the selectivity to hydrogen is truly remarkable, but the conditions for this reaction to occur this way must be found very carefully. And palladium is one of very, very few metals uh, that it will actually produce hydrogen. Now the CO-CO2 ratio is not quite satisfactory. You might want to control that ratio. You might want to make more CO and less CO2, for example, or more CO2 and less CO, depending. So how do we control? What is the catalytic principle for controlling CO, CO2 ratio? Obviously, the thought, the first thought that are supported by experimental evidence is that you, what you have uh, prior to the CO, CO2 uh, uh, oxidation is surface atomic carbon. How do you control oxidation of surface atomic carbon to CO versus CO2? Well, the thing that occurs to everybody uh, who reads catalysis literature is ensemble control. If uh, you can take a, let's say, carbon or CHX fragment, which has plenty of oxygen neighbors on the palladium surface, then the result of oxidation is going to be carbon dioxide. And if you block the sites so that only one ox the neighboring oxygen will be available to carbon, then you're going to have uh, lower oxidation products. In our case, we're concerned for a moment uh, by, uh, with carbon monoxide. And the halogen modifier 
and I'm bringing nothing, I, I, I say uh, bringing coal to Newcastle is uh, when you talk about uh, halogen control, it's uh, in ethylene epoxidation. They, some, one company that I know about uh, uses that principle and so on. But how does it work uh, in, in, uh, in silver catalysis? Now we, we were just transferring the idea to the uh, catalysis by palladium. But these, uh, if we make a pocket here, surrounded by chlorine, they are two-dimensional, and we have the luxury, uh, having been supported by basic energy, the OE, uh, to work with single crystals, so we, we might want to look how these ensembles can be actually prepared and uh, they are two-dimensional ideally we need to do the structure of these ensembles and uh, we need to have some source if you put on the surface chlorine gas you you've got to get patches of chlorine and nothing will happen that is of any use to catalysis so you have to create these pockets or features or whatever well this is a uh, Burwell lecture and uh, I'm going to ask you who's this? Uh, that's Professor Burwell okay and uh, I'm going to demonstrate the point uh, now this is this is actually taken from a book which shows Burwell is here. here is Sir Eric Redeal uh, Frank Stone uh, this is Chimino, uh, Sir Hugh Taylor, I think, and this is Charles Campbell. You now, if you take this little picture and magnify it, uh, you will see the dot matrix uh, that is in the print. Uh, this is the dot matrix here. It's uh, what the surface science people call the P one by one structure, and uh, that structure has no interesting information. The ensembles are here, the receptor for, <laughs> for chemicals are here. But how do we get at these features, okay? Well, let's, uh, let me try my little demonstration. Don't look back because uh, you might uh, get hit by laser. This is not a war. But somebody turn off the projector for me. Uh, a diffraction pattern which is produced uh, from that big reduced size picture of Professor Burwell's. This is Professor Burwell in reciprocal space. <laughs> Fourier transform of Professor Burwell. Now, uh, the regular structure, the uninteresting structure, gives rise to those spots there, the sharp spots. Professor Burwell's features give rise to the fuzzy spots, the fuzziness. But you can then take this, or you can simulate any structure that you have on the surface, produce a diffraction pattern, if you do it with electrons, you compare your results. That is how we study partially ordered or to a large degree disordered structures. Let me show you uh, in a moment uh, The uninteresting uh, oh, oh, we need a passage here. Excuse me, sir. Remember, uh, features translate to fuzzy spots, and regular matrix translates to regular spots. Uh, uh, 
just to demonstrate what a plain regular structure will do for you, I'm going to do a little thing here, which I do in my freshman chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a megabyte uh, memory chip uh, from local AT&T. These are the transistors here. And you see that they make a regular structure here, right? No features, regular structure. And they, there are connectors here and all sorts of things, but those connectors and everything is in regular structure. I've got to demonstrate that if you have just a plain regular structure, that uh, uh, you get uh, uh, just a regular pattern. Now I need to uh, turn off uh, that light and the projector. We get, now look at the ceiling, we get 20th order reflections in here. The Bragg condition doesn't have to be satisfied because we are dealing with two-dimensional patterns. And uh, I'm, I'm going to move it a little bit. So this is the lead pattern, low energy electron diffraction pattern simulated by light from a regular structure, no matter that the ref regular structure now has fuzzy spots, uh, the diffraction pattern has sharp spots. Professor Burwell's features then are the ones that create the fuzzy spots. And let me show you what, uh, how, how this works in the case of palladium. It's not going to be as pretty as the photograph that I have shown to you. But uh, anyway, this is what we do. And I think uh, this leads us, leads us to some concepts. Uh, first of all, We look at uh, we free cover a palladium surface uh, with uh, dichloromethane. Dichloromethane completely dissociates at room temperature into chlorine atoms, carbon atoms, and hydrogen atoms on palladium surface. This time shown as the small dots are the palladium atoms. Uh, as the 100 phase. <coughs> but the chlorine atoms don't move. They don't move away. This is a dissociated CCL2, but the fragments at longer than interatom interatomic distances stay together and uh, they remain there. Now, if we have a small concentration of dichloromethane, such as here, then we can put onto the surface a lot of oxygen, the red spot. So oxygen makes this its own regular structure and there's some dichloromethane. And we can put in a lot of dichloromethane to saturation, in fact, uh, which is not that much of a saturation, only 20% of the surface. And then we have dichloromethane fragments, chlorines here and oxygen here. If we look at the neighborhood of these frag of the carbons, some of the carbons have only one oxygen in the neighborhood, and some of the carbons have two oxygens in the neighborhood. And we simply count them. And we say anything that has two or more oxygens in the neighborhood is going to be ensemble allowed carbon dioxide. Anything that has one oxygen or less in the neighborhood is going to be ensemble generated carbon monoxide. Now, if you engage in a simplistic thinking like this, Incidentally, these are the fuzzy spots uh, that follow, the observed by lead and uh, produced by simulation of these structures. And this is why we know that these structures really exist, because we investigated 17, 18, 19 different structures. And only those which give us the fuzzy spots in the right positions are then the accepted structure. So basically what we do here is a simulation of partially disordered ensemble structures. <coughs> But then where is the catalysis? Well, we remember we wanted to control the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide ratio. The experimental finding is simply, as you would expect, uh, as you increase the surface chlorine concentration, you are reducing the selectivity to CO2, and you are increasing the selectivity in favor of CO. OK, so now how does the count work? It's not absolute, but 
the counting of the neighbors gave us this explanation of selective taking into account all the other data, lead data and so on, and this uh, selectivity to CO2. The important point being, by the time the surface is saturated with dichloromethane and that the carbon atoms are oxidized, we get 80% uh, selectivity to CO and small. So the idea for the catalytic testing of these catalysts is if you want to make lots of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, use palladium, which is tickled with chlorine, but you, one, one has to do it so that one really controls the surface concentration of the chlorine well, and secondly, one uses the right source of chlorine. It cannot be chlorine gas, and in fact, the dichloromethane is not the best source either. There are other sources, and we're playing now with what we would call a two-dimensional shape selectivity, if you will, by starting doing this with hexachlorobenzene and uh, chlorinated naphthalenes and so on, and then burning the inside carbon. This burning of the inside carbon is specific to palladium because you can get rid of the oxygen after you've burnt off the carbon, and the palladium metal surface is regenerated. You cannot do that with nickel, because you would le uh, be left with plast uh, nickel plastered with oxygen, which will then recrystallize into nickel oxide. So once again, we show that the, uh, that the choice of the metal here was very important. Now I now have, of course everybody knows, that the way to make synthesis gas is to steam reform methane and not to do it by this. What I'm saying here that chemistry exists on palladium, modified slightly with chlorine for direct oxidation of methane to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Now I have a synthesis gas, and in fact, if I want to synthesize alcohols, uh, I need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the synthesis gas for that reaction to occur rapidly. I'm now going into something that's been published uh, in our work on alcohol synthesis, but there are some fantastic features uh, of, of uh, right starting from methanol, which still fascinate me. I remember the time when I was talking about methanol years ago here, and Tom <laughs> Wilson was saying, when will ever somebody crack that mechanism of that reaction? It turns out that there's still different opinions and probably different mechanisms for that reaction on different catalysts. And we suggested years ago in 1979 that the active center is copper one plus. There was a huge controversy in the literature and we got tired of that controversy. And so we replaced the copper one plus, plus by an element which will do the same as copper one plus, namely to stick to an OH group, then insert carbon monoxide to make a formate ion. What occurs to you is to use uh, alkali metal, dope the catalyst on the surface by, uh, by alkali hydroxide, let's say, Insertion of carbon monoxide into the OH bond to make formate is a readily occurring reaction. There's numerous proofs of that in solutions as well as in the surface uh, literature. Uh, then this gets oxidized and rejects one of the two oxygens in the form of water, gets oxidized to surface methoxide, then the surface methoxide gets hydrolyzed to methanol. What is shown here is a result of isotope work in which we were actually putting in the deuterium, not in the, from the gaseous hydrogen, which is the hydrogenating agent, but from the D2O, which is a, ma a major promoter for the methanol synthesis, forming the OD groups and the deuterium, one of the three uh, atoms of CH3 group ended up as deuterium, the remaining two were coming from the unlabeled hydrogen. The promotion and uh, now, uh, you might say this is an academic play, and surely it was at the beginning, but uh, 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 we have this office of research at Lehigh University who wants us to patent things. <coughs> and so we did so and were awarded uh, the patent for methanol synthesis accelerated by heavy alkali, and the surf surface dopant does not have to be hydroxide, it could be formate, for example, because the hydroxides chew up the catalyst and so on. The copper zinc oxide part forms the hydrogenation component and we therefore have a bifunctional catalyst uh, in which we have a basic function, that's the cesium, 
the counter ion of which the hydroxyl group provides for a nucleophilic attack on carbon monoxide and formate formation. And then we have an activation of hydrogen and copper zinc oxide part, which then hydrogenates to methanol. Compared to the cesium undoped catalyst, uh, this is a 300, so there's a scale below here, the effects of small concentrations of cesium are large, and then when the concentration of cesium is uh, uh, larger still, the activity goes down because we have a competition with this bifunctionality between the basic sites and the hydrogenate, uh, hydrogenating sites. By the time we are putting too much base in, we are killing the hydrogenation sites that uh, is here. And of course, if you uh, do research, uh, as one is always tempted to do, by doping your catalyst with 10% of the dopant, uh, this is 2%, and 10% would be here, then your immediate conclusion will be that the alkali dopants are killing methanol synthesis activity over these catalysts because you have missed all this maximum. And in fact, uh, most of the patent literature on methanol, as well as open literature, says alkali are bad for you. Don't, that, that's why we uh, were awarded the patent because we were going counter to the wisdom that was found there in the patent and open literature. Now, I must mention that this, uh, select, that this alkali doped catalyst is still under the methanol synthesis conditions, highly selective for methanol, even though that you might have uh, one or two percent of cesium in it. Incidentally, this is a nominal concentration. We know what the surface concentrations are. We know that the cesium spreads, and we know that it sits primarily on the zinc oxide phase from various surface analytical uh, researches. At this point, the surface concentration of the cesium is about 20% of the surface is covered with the cesium salt. 80% is still the hydrogenation component. You need 20% of base and 80% of hydrogenation component to make that catalyst work at optimum. If one changes conditions, one can get on in this system to higher alcohols. The conditions are higher temperatures and lower hydrogen to CO ratio. And the first step in that higher alcohol synthesis must be C1 to C2 step. Several mechanisms have been proposed in, in the past. Classical organometallic uh, uh, sy synthetic pr uh, insertion of carbon monoxide into the alkyl metal bond. Uh, CO insertion, NATA, and we thought initially that this could be working. Insertion into the methoxide bond to make an acetate ion, which is then hydrogenated to, uh, to ethanol. <coughs> then Mazanek at Sohio proposed a, 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 whole, a whole bunch of steps which amount to CO insertion also. And then, this is a Joe Fox, I had a discussion with somebody about Joe Fox. This is a Lehigh Joe Fox, uh, because uh, Lehigh Joe Fox uh, a work, works for Sohio, there was a competition between uh, uh, this mechanism and the Mazanet mechanism. And of course, if you study different catalysts, you will find that one mechanism works on one, another one works on another. But uh, basically, these three are CO insertion mechanisms, and this is a kind of a coupling mechanism. So if you ins inject methanol and follow what the isotopic composition of ethanol is going to be, this CH3 group can come from methanol, but this is a CO. Label methanol, don't label CO. And uh, there is a, another uh, system that is well known to you, union carbide as well as Dow, where the bifunctionality was provided by a combination of base with another hydrogenation component and smolidine sulfide. And in this case, I just point out where we in injected labeled methanol and unlabeled carbon monoxide then the ethanol had the classic expected CO insertion composition, the classic organometallic mechanism. This carbon was labeled, coming from methanol, this carbon was unlabeled, coming from carbon monoxide, and the synthesis continues to the higher alcohols this way. This is also written in the classic Fischer-Tropsch synthesis of oxygenate. I'm referring here only to the isotopic composition and consistency with the CO insertion 
mechanism. I'm saying that the carbon, uh, this, uh, this carbon comes from carbon monoxide, and this carbon comes from methanol, which is injected into the synthesis gas, and one of the three synthesis mechanisms is actually possible, of the CO insertion mechanism. But if you do this same experiment on uh, the zinc oxide with copper, with the alkali, you will find a very surprising result, and that is you inject labeled methanol into unlabeled carbon monoxide, and in the ethanol that is so produced, you will find both labels, no question about it, coming from methanol as if the carbon monoxide weren't a reactant at all. This is the Joe Fox, the Lehigh Joe Fox mechanism. It's a beginning step of the foremost chemistry, and it is in fact a very slow step. In the same system, you have another CO insertion mechanism, which gives rise to methyl formate, and in that methyl formate, this carbon does come from methanol, and this carbon does come from carbon monoxide. So that also tells you that the methyl formate is not a precursor of this ethanol. The ethanol is formed by a different mechanism than uh, methyl formate. Methyl formate is made by CO insertion and ethanol by a coupling reaction. As one proceeds through the synthesis from C1 to C2, this was an un un unexpected result, one gets into the C2 to C3 step and there was partial, uh, some of what we observed was expected and some was unexpected. You can do NMR, of course, and you can do C13 NMR. You can identify in the product every carbon without separation, se separation of the mixture uh, in the product. The result now over the copper zinc oxide alkali doped catalyst is as follows. Yeah, now we inject the C2 alcohol because we are making the C3 alcohol by addition of the synthesis gas. <coughs> uh, the C2 alcohol labeled here with the, with the carbon 13 gives us over the cesium doped copper zinc oxide exclusively the label here. This, I, I think fisher Trops people would call this an alpha carbon and this would be called a gamma carbon. The reaction is specific to the heavy alkali, therefore requires a strong, relatively strong base. In this system, alcohols are in equilibrium with their aldehydes, and uh, we, we see some of these aldehydes, and this indicates to you that what might be involved is some kind of aldol chemistry. That is, uh, now I'm going to go through some calculations uh, that will show you how we think that aldol chemistry occurs. First, we take acid aldehyde and react it with, gay, uh, with base to make enolate or carbonyl. Known reaction, but you have to calculate the enthalpies of formation of that en enolate. Then we react that enolate with anything that adds by aldol coupling, uh, such as formaldehyde coming by dehydrogenation of methanol or from the synthesis gas, and that formaldehyde adds here. What we get is 1,3-keto-alkoxide that is bonded to the alcohol. I call it cis-aldolate. I'm sure that this is not a IUPAC terminology, but uh, this is what you would expect as a first step in the aldol synthesis. But then what you expect is that this oxygen picks up a proton somewhere, loses water, and uh, this gets hydrogenated to, uh, to a linear propanol, but then the label would remain here. What happens instead in our system is that there is an uh, is isomerization. This keto group, this alkoxide group, is bonded to the alkali ion more strongly than the keto group. Incidentally, these are results of calculations with optimized geometry and all that stuff. Now we, we are studying how much energy will it cost depending on the nature of this alkali cation to move this group into the trans configuration because the trans configuration 
will render the CO group, the carbonyl to hydrogenation to CO3, CH3, over the copper zinc oxide uh, uh, hydrogenation component of the catalyst. So we studied theoretically this reaction, and interestingly, uh, what was found that that reaction costs you awful lot more energy if the cations are small and awful lot less energy if they are large. In other words, this isomerization is easiest for the heavy alkali ions, such as cesium, which is our co-catalyst. If we then summarize the whole energy profile of that kind of aldol condensation, we first react acid aldehyde labeled here with potassium hydroxide or cesium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, whatever. We make the enolate or carbon ion with this amount of released energy. Then we make the cis configuration of 1,3 keto alkoxide, which is transposed into the trans configuration, costing this much energy. In fact, we calculated the transition states here, identified them by the usual criteria, and found that the transition state is close to the trans configuration. Essentially, the trans isomer is the transition state. There's only a small energy difference. Then we hydrogenate this end here to produce the linear propanol of the isotopic composition that the experiment directed us to. In other words, specifically, we, this reaction cycle rejects uh, the oxygen of the injected ethanol and retains, that, that is where the oxygen is rejected, uh, retains specifically the oxygen of the added C1 intermediate. We call this because the expectation of the aldol synthesis is that this OH group or uh, CO group should be here. We call this the aldol coupling with oxygen retention reversal. We gave it this name and the journals accepted it. You cannot change it. <laughs> but, of course, you, you, you will challenge it. Now, if one now looks at these reactions in all generality, one can add spaghetti instead of formaldehyde. One can add another aldehyde with all sorts of groups, R groups. And there are three types of groups here labeled R, R double prime, and R prime, which are added. Uh, this, this would be a synthesis in which I am adding this kind of alcohol. If R prime is hydrogen, this is a primary alcohol. If R prime is a, a CH3 group or other group, alkyl, then it's a secondary alcohol. I can inject into this synthesis secondary alcohols, even though that the synthesis does not produce secondary alcohol. I can make new products from these sec secondary alcohols. And then at one stage, I can add another terminal aldehyde or alcohol, and the 1,3-keto uh, alkoxide now has the spaghetti here, R prime group here, and R double prime group here. And the same mechanism repeats over and over, and I will show you uh, the products that were, uh, that were observed. Uh, we R stands for this reversal of oxygen retention. This is the reaction that I uh, showed to you this carbon was labeled. This was uh, a label ended up in the gamma position. Then we can follow the native synthesis, but if we inject an alcohol which is not native, we get a pro bunch of products which are not normal product of the synthesis. Here we are injecting uh, isopropanol, secondary propanol, and in fact, inject isopropanol Couple it with carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and your main product is going to be linear butanol. That's this synthesis part. <coughs> and uh, that product is observed, and in fact, isotopic experiments were done for this. There are some more complex uh, reactions in which uh, C2 plus C2 are combining, and uh, we are getting uh, two labels from these and secondary alcohol, as I indicated. Well, this all is put together, and you uh, look for features of the synthesis. Uh, you have a chain growth, obviously, and there are just two dominant CC bond forming reactions. One is the beta addition, 
which gives rise to this 1,3-keto alkoxide <coughs> and you need the second to oxygen carbon for it and the other is the foremost chemistry C1 to C2 and this repeats over and over and the selectivity to the different alcohol products is dictated by the ratio of efficiency of these two reactions. Now, the effect of cesium is that it makes this reaction extremely efficient. Now, imagine you have ethanol that has the beta carbon that goes very efficiently to linear propanol. So you expect a product composition in which ethanol will be at minimum. And then you will get linear propanol and next will be 2-methyl 1-propanol, otherwise known as isobutanol. When all of this is done and uh, worked out in mathematical terms, you invite Kevin Smith to do this for you. He produces an engineering model, and uh, this, these chemical mechanisms are embedded into an engineering model, which is five kinetic constants and predicts uh, 25 different products. Uh, and here is how it works. Uh, it's, uh, often we think that our analytical error is actually greater than the uh, error of this model. It's a satisfactory model. The, in terms of product composition, you can get composition in which the ethanol is at minimum, as I say, because it's rapidly converted to linear propanol, which is rapidly converted to the isobutanol. And this, uh, the bar, black bars are experiment, and the red bars are the model. There are some esters in, uh, in, in, in the product, and so on, and the number of other products. But basically, you can make, as people know really well on this, in this system, methanol and isobutanol as a, do a dominant product. You can, in fact, modify, governed or guided by the model, you can modify the reaction conditions so that you can make these one to one. But this will not be necessary in what we, wa what we want to make next. What we want to make next uh, is take these two alcohols and make an ether from them. Why should we want to make an ether? Because uh, the first thing that occurs to you, isobutanol can be dehydrated catalytically to isobutene and there is a known process for coupling of isobutene with methanol to MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether. But we don't have isobutene and we want to instead couple directly these two alcohols. The well, obvious choice of a catalyst this time is an acid. Okay. Uh, so we uh, entered a uh, new to us area and used an acid. And what's better than an acid is a super acid. And so we used super acidic resins. They are in kind of a semi market or gray market, I call it, a Nafion H here, which uh, does the following uh, you take the methanol to isobutanol ratio 2 to 1, just as it's coming from the previous synthesis. And you follow the products as a function of pressure. At low pressures, indeed as expected, the isobutanol will dehydrate primarily to isobutene. But as you increase the pressure, that reaction will be rapidly suppressed in favor of reactions that give rise to ethers but the ether is not MTBE. The ether is MIBE, methyl isobutyl ether, isomer of MTBE. So what this tells you is that the formation of MIBE does not go via isobutene, via the usual carbonium ion mechanism. It has to be another mechanism. So you ask yourself a question, what is the mechanism that gives rise to MIBE from the two alcohols that does not involve carbonium ion? And furthermore, what causes the selectivity to MIBE to be so much larger than uh, that to dimethyl ether or even to diisobutyl ether? If statistics were true, in other words, if it didn't matter to the catalyst whether it combines methanol and isobutanol, isobutanol and isobutanol, methanol with methanol, then these ratios should, should be with this in, input ratio 4 to 4 
to 1. But they are something like 19 to 9 to 1. So we have an extraordinary selectivity to the mixed ether. Well, first, we are university researchers. And when it comes to the distinguishing uh, isomers uh, or MTBE from MIBE, everybody suspects us. Uh, so let me, let me show you that we do things right. Uh, here is a mass spec spectrum of MTBE and MIBE. There's no mistake can be made. We don't make these mistakes and we are analyzing the MIBE right and our product is MIBE, methyl isobutyl ether, this catalysis. Further, there's a competition for the acid site. The Nafion has SO3H groups on a fluorocarbon backbone. Now, these are the superacid uh, sites. Now, if we keep the isobutanol constant and increase uh, the partial pressure of methanol, we get kinetics, these are all steady states, uh, we get kinetics such that the rate first increases and then with further methanol addition decreases. There's a typical kinetics uh, that tells you that there is a competition for the same sites between the two alcohols that are to be coupled. There's a competition for the two sites which is not like in enzyme kinetics because in enzyme kinetics you usually, enzyme works usually on one substrate and usually the kinetics are going to a saturation. So this is a typical competition kinetics. For, so we know that the two uh, alcohols are activated by the same site, but they are not activated to carbonium ions. So how does it go? If we do the same experiment with isobutanol, we pr uh, keeping methanol constant, we, do the, we get the same kind of curve, except that it's shifted. We can calculate the equilibrium constant of binding to the acid sites of isobutanol and of methanol, and we find that isobutanol is bonded with equilibrium constant about four times as great as methanol. So we know isobutanol is bonded more strongly than methanol. And this is the key to the selectivity in favor of the mixed ether. <coughs> but let me first summarize what we know about it and then speculate on the mechanism. The mechanism of coupling of these two alcohols is direct. We know that it's bimolecular. The theoretical curve there was a line uh, curve in which there was a product of partial pressures of the two alcohols. We know that there is a competition of the sites, and we know that there's a preference if we call R isobutyl and R prime methyl, that there's a preference to the mixed ether. We know that the active species cannot be carbonium. So what occurs to you is that it's oxonium, but if we have two oxoniums, uh, how do they combine to an ether? That is not written in any organic chemistry textbook. The second thing that the alcohol can do with the SO3H group is to make an ester. If I have two esters, uh, how do I make an ether? I make an ether and anhydride of two SO3H groups, possibly so. But our momentarily preferred mechanism is such that in fact one of the two alcohols, isobutanol, makes the ester. The oxonium is of course a precursor of that ester. But it reacts in the ester form with the oxonium of methanol which sits on its counter ion. And this reaction is easily written in terms of uh, either concerted or stepwise process to give you the mixed ether and two SO3H groups uh, which regenerate the acid sites of the catalyst. So what <laughs> did we do today? We've uh, used uh, oxidation catalysis at the beginning, then we used a combination bifunctional base and hydrogenation catalysis, then we used uh, acid catalysis. Is there any other catalysis that we, we can use? But the important thing to me now is that uh, in these mixed ethers, every carbon came through came from the origin. It came from either methane or carbon itself that I started with. You know now that the MTB is produced from isobutene, which comes from petroleum, and, uh, uh, and methanol, which comes from natural gas. 
So all of these are coming from natural gas. Uh, let me summarize uh, what we, I summarize this because uh, I have a president at Lehigh University who is a civil engineer and mechanical engineer, and he wants uh, he says, well, uh, he's very supportive. He supported our ESCA project, and when he sees ours, uh, when he sees uh, uh, shiny metal and electronics, he's all sold on it. But he is not sold on chemical mechanisms. He says, is, how do you go about catalysis? Is this kind of a black art, or do you use any principles? Okay. And uh, I, I say, oh, Peter, this is hard for me to <laughs> explain this to you. Uh, 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 but uh, we do do some thinking ahead of the time, and we do use principles. So, what principles did we use here in the oxidation to formaldehyde? We made these Coulombic pairs, and basically it's a chemical control, chemical control by two redox systems and Lewis acid at the same time, of the chemical reaction. In here, the control was also chemical, but then it became geometric, when we added chlorine and confined the ensemble so that we got more CO and less CO2. So this, this is a, in the oxidation catalysis, I claim I have used principles. In the hydrogenation and base catalysis, uh, I believe that the bifunctionality clearly is originating from uh, the chemical principles that are brought about by the heavy alkali. The light alkalis don't do it. It's very clear that the counter ion of the heavy alkali is the most basic that is needed for all this catalysis. If you put sodium in here, you get a mild retardation effect on all these reactions simply because sodium mixes with the catalyst, diffuses inside, and, and uh, I claim I have used principles. In the Hydrogenation and base catalysis, uh, I believe that the bifunctionality clearly is originating from uh, the chemical principles that are brought about by the heavy alkali. The light alkalis don't do it. It's very clear that the counter ion of the heavy alkali is the most basic that is needed for all this catalysis. If you put sodium in here, you get a mild retardation effect on all these reactions simply because sodium mixes with the catalyst, diffuses inside, and, and uh, generally busts the catalyst, but not so with these large alkali down to potassium. Okay. So in here, we use purely uh, chemical principles. In fact, uh, we know about these reactions that are not, not at all in any way geometrically or diffusion or mass transport or otherwise controlled. <coughs> Is there anything that we have discovered in these reactions? Well, if you believe that this goes to, uh, against the patent literature, we did uh, discover that the selectivity to methanol is enhanced, uh, the rate is enhanced and the selectivity is retained in the presence of these heavy alkali. And in the higher alcohol synthesis, uh, we are getting the alcohol that goes counter to the uh, textbook aldol result. Uh, so uh, that is because we are carrying out the reaction so that we are pinning the alkoxide group on the alkali ion and allowing the carbonyl group to be hydrogenated uh, before the alkoxide group hydrolyzes. <coughs> what did we do? What kind of principle did we use in the esters? Both the chemical superacid principle as well as some, some physical chemistry rather elemental in which we determine that one alcohol is bonded more strongly than the other, and that is a key to the selectivity to the uh, higher alcohol. But the product uh, composition taught us also that some commonly anticipated reaction, namely carbonium ion, doesn't go here. There are some other reactions which I don't want to uh, discuss now. So now my answer to President Likens, Peter Likens, is yeah, yeah, well, it's, a, it's not black art, it's art, and it's science, and it's uh, entertainment, basically, what we do in catalysis. And perhaps uh, you can uh, uh, say that it's organized madness, uh, and I 
have it expressed better by the classics here. Those, that's when Polonius talks to Hamlet, them. this looks like madness, but there's a method to it. Okay, thank you for your attention. which uh, in the uh, dehydrogenation mechanism of, uh, that involves alcohols. Uh, I think in this system you do need a hydride transfer just to count the electrons. Uh, was in a redox system, and I was wondering if there's something other than... Uh, okay, uh, you may be referring to the mechanism which uh, goes from methoxide to formaldehyde, and you need to pick up the hydride. Uh, I think that mechanism is not really proven. Uh, it's a mechanism that everybody just uh, has a consensus about and believes in, but it, it has to be experimented. It's, it's uh, amenable to spectroscopy. It can be determined spectroscopically because you will look at the methoxide by infrared, and then you observe the hydride also by infrared as some cation hydride vibration, and these are all observable. So if you do, for example, in the early times, the zinc hydrogen hydride was... Uh, observed that copper hydride is observed by v having a very low frequency of the metal hydrogen bond. So I think it's, it's provable, but it's not proven at this moment. I, I have trouble getting uh, my mind around the your first system when you have an iron and copper, you know, couple close together on a zinc oxide for the surface. I guess my problem is that I never really worked with that surface, but uh, I do recall these talks that uh, Mark Barteau had given, which he described the zinc oxide crystallized as being uh, essentially the uh, closest pattern of zinc cations exposed on one side, uh, and I, I can't quite see why well, iron or copper would sit on that, and then the other side is a close packet of oxygen. Cations could sit there, I guess, but why would they want to sit together in such a concerted way? Uh, zinc oxide is a hexagonal structure. It's a basically a hexagonal diamond. And you can indeed terminate the hexagonal diamond uh, on the basal plane by zincs only here and oxygens only here. But what I have shown on my slide was, were the side surfaces, which have alternating zinc and oxygen. And in fact, every time, if you grow a, a single crystal of zinc oxide, it's not going to be the basal plane. You will see needles which have hexagonal faces and growing. And that basal plane that you're talking about, Mark Barto is talking about, is a high energy surface which is prepared only when you cut the surface and, uh, in that particular way. But it's not a stable surface uh, of zinc oxide. We are talking about 0001 index and 0001 bar index on the zinc oxide. These are unstable planes. It's a very unusual situation, and the people like uh, Mark or, or Dr. Spitzer in uh, Spicer in California, they like playing with those because they want to show some chemical anisotropy. But in a regular catalyst, and every time you work with an ordinary dispersed zinc oxide, it's the one zero one bar zero phase or that, that is exposed. And in that, that is electrically neutral. There are even rules on this. Uh, electrically neutral phase is more stable in these ionic partially ionic compounds than the zinc only and oxygen only. So basically you would have to have a very special preparation to prepare those uh, basal planes with zinc oxide. But even there, why would the oxygen, or why would the irons and the coppers want to pair up to give you this? Uh, why do they pair up is the following. We have the ESCA result that the iron is trivalent and it sits substitutionally in place of divalent zinc. So this brings into the zinc site a one extra positive charge, three minus two. So that, that site can be labeled plus. Then on the copper, copper goes for another zinc two plus, replaces the zinc oxide, the zinc double plus, 
but carries only one charge. And you can, in SK, you can easily prove that the copper is not divalent because there are shake-up peaks, and these shake-up peaks are totally absent. So the copper is one plus. This, this carries a formally a negative charge because one plus is one negative charge attached to the two plus that were there before. So I have one plus for iron three here, and one minus for copper one here, and that makes a Coulombic pair. In fact, uh, I didn't tell you the whole story, but uh, the catalysts are doped through the bulk at 1% overall level. But there is an enrichment when we cook these catalysts, enrichment of these elements on the surface, and they travel together. And equimolar, uh, uh, equimolar uh, to enrich the surface to three and a half percent. That was done by quantitative analysis on the CN, Cienta Esca. It's not an easy analysis to work with those low concentrations, but that, that's, that's the result of that analysis. So we not only determine the valence state and the coordination, but also the stoichiometric equivalent. And the third experiment that uh, helps uh, prove that these are plumbic pairs is the EPR experiment. The electron of the iron is partially residing on the nucleus of the uh, copper 63 and gives rise to chops uh, the line into a uh, super hyperfine split line. That prep is all right. You mentioned the case of palladium that you required the last surface to get the reaction on the and how often is the big damage of the We're still working on this system. The question is, uh, is this particular crystal face uh, the condition for cracking methane, or can you crack it on other faces? We have not explored them all. I'm just reporting to you a result uh, after a lot of trouble with the 100, which did not crack methane, that this particular plane does it. But we don't know at this moment, for example, the triequiangular face, smooth, angular phase will not crack methane. We don't know that. If you would accept, uh, anticipate that result, then look at the cubo octa. You, you, how, how do we transfer this information to particles? First, we must know how the particles look. Let's suppose that the palladium crystallite will be a cubo octahedron. The cubo octahedron <coughs> has uh, one zero zero facets and one 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 facets. The 100 facets will be inactive for this, and then 111 facets will be active. That's it. We already know that such a difference exists for oxygen. But that, yeah. I was saying that's exactly what I was asking, that if it requires the particular structure, it will be high to get it in hard to get it on a supporting canvas all the time. Uh, I don't know. That, that, uh, that's the art, isn't it, in preparation of polycrystal. First of all, small particles of metals with our own support are very often single crystals. They are very often single crystals. We just don't have the resolution in the methodology, in the electron microscope, and so on, just to characterize the surface properly. But they are single crystals, or they might be twin crystals. But that is an art and, and, and science that has to be properly developed yet. But what is done here in these single crystal studies, it gives you hints. Uh, there's no question then in, uh, that in ammonia synthesis, it's the iron 111 phase that is far more active than the, uh, than the other phases of iron. So that's the information that you're getting. Well, you tell me how to prepare 111 phase in polycrystalline uh, iron, and uh, of course you can use epitaxial principles, you can use ideas, you can use supports, which actually uh, prefer that particular crystal index. But that's the next art. I'm just, uh, we're not there yet. But I believe that if th what has to be developed is a good atomic uh, resolution electron microscopy for these small particles. You prepare your palladium catalyst, which has 15 angstrom particles. They are single crystals. You want to know 
position of every crystal, if it's an alumina of every atom that, that's there, then you can say what the, crystal, uh, what, what the facets are. But certainly, certainly the small particles are single crystals for the most part. On the uh, uh, reaction on the palladium surface that uh, you're talking, making CO and hydrogen, how does that respond to, in terms of kinetics, uh, respect to oxygen and uh, methane partial pressures? And how does it change with the uh, energy? Do you always get CO and hydrogen? No, no, no. You always, most always, get uh, CO2 in water. <laughs> but, uh, but let me give you the specific conditions here. Oh, looking at much condition as the, uh, how, how does it relate to the water and oxygen and methane? Uh, Unfortunately, this is an, uh, we have the data, but this is an abbreviated table, and I did not put in it. Oh, yeah, I did. Here. Uh, uh, methane to oxygen ratio. There was excess of methane in these experiments. Uh, these are the conversion rates. These are the selectivities. The temperatures uh, uh, are here. <coughs> That, that's a set of conditions. Uh, it was palladia supported in silica <coughs> catalyst. So this is a real catalyst. Uh, uh, these are the uh, gas hourly space velocities and the total pressure. This experiment was uh, done at atmosphere, not at high pressures, atmospheric pressures. Most of the time you get CO2 and water. Uh, the palladium particles, as far as we know, were in the range of 200 angstroms or smaller. So the silica was a homemade silica. It was not the Davidson silica with lots of sodium in it, uh, we believe. And they, actually, the precursor of the palladium was palladium chloride. But we were carefully trying to see that in this case we do not have a, any chlorine in the system. But it cannot be excluded that traces of chlorine were actually present in here. So the silica was a, a fairly high surface uh, area silica. For us, initially hydroxylated <coughs> silica. Now, all that showed was just with one ratio. Don't have the <coughs> oh, there are uh, there's lots of experiments at different ratios, but this is the one that gave you this high selectivity to hydrogen. In most other experiments, you are going to get full oxidation. In fact, we tried even to dope this uh, copper uh, iron doped zinc oxide with small amounts ppm's of palladium. And this shift, because we wanted to make the formaldehyde at lower temperatures, uh, and the selectivity that was uh, lowered in favor of CO2. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy system, it's a very difficult system, but it, uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here, that there is a chemistry in it, and I'm hinging primarily on the single crystal work. Did you see that experiment? You, you, do, you have oxygen present in the palladium surface, and you dissolve hydrogen and not water, and this is absolutely unambiguous, uh, correct result. Was there any oxygen left in the in the in the single crystal? Oh, uh, in here, uh, practically not. This was this was almost uh, this was to the to the exhaustion of oxygen. Yeah, in the flow experiment. Mm -hmm. Let's thank our speaker again. I'd like to remind everybody that the next meeting of the Tri-State Cattle Club is February 20th, 1991 in Ashland, Kentucky. Speaker is Dr. Edmund Poe.
and he will speak on acidic properties of niobia containing aerogels. And don't forget May 5 through 9, the 12th and a.m. Thank you very much.